Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 12th of January, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? First name is Stanley, and the last name is Heidenreich, H-E-I-D-E-N-R-E-I-C-H. Born in Albany, New York. Okay. Um, what was your high? What was your education prior to entering service? I went to Milne High School. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, yes. Matter of fact, I was at home and heard it on the radio at that time. And uh, the, uh, of course, it was that just blew up everybody, and that was the. News of the day, of course. Mm -hmm. and, Do you remember uh, your own personal reaction? Well, yes, it was. <coughs> excuse me, it was the. Uh, I guess it came as a shock, but mm -hmm. I, I guess uh, at that time, with the uh, Japanese getting into the war, uh, it wasn't inconceivable. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, did you enlist, or were you drafted? No, I, well, I, when I say I enlisted, uh, the interesting part here is that when I turned 18, uh, of course, you weren't being drafted until you were 18 mm -hmm. at that time, and uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I went down to the draft board to find out if I was going to be drafted. I wanted to ensure that I was able to go into the 10th because I did know some people that were already in the 10th that were skiers and good friends. and. Uh, and what I had to do, I had to get three letters of recommendation that I knew and uh, that, but I wanted to ensure with the draft board that that's where I was going to be sent. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, when I came home that day, uh, it, was, you know, it was just right after school, or I was still in school, right at the end of the season, that uh, <clears throat> my dad asked me what I'd done that day, and I told him, <laughs> he said, you did what? <laughs> But anyhow, the uh, I went into the uh, service uh, in the fall, September of uh, '43. So you you knew you wanted to be in the Tenth Mountain. It, yeah. Now, how long had that been formed before you uh, went into it? Well, I knew you had to have three letters of recommendation, mm -hmm. and uh, but that was uh, skiing was uh, a big thing in my life even mm -hmm. back then, and. And uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> where did you go for your basic training? Basic training was out of the camp called Camp uh, Hale, Colorado, and which is located in the Rockies, of course, out there. At the elevation of the camp was 9,500 feet, and like everyone else knew that. Uh, went out there that wasn't used to that elevation. It took you pretty near a month to uh, acclimate yourself to being able to breathe and walk and exercise and doing everything without getting out of breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I uh, was drafted and went out there in September of uh, 43 and uh, that's where I trained. Uh, out there, and there was, all training was from that elevation on up to as high as 12,000 feet. Describe your your basic training. This would have been different than others because of the because unit of the, you were the type in. of unit. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we did a lot of skiing. Of course, nothing was on it was fast or anything. But we learned, uh, or I say we learned, we did all kinds of various maneuvers on skis and how to attack. Uh, the, you might say the uh, the pins back in when they were fighting the Russians were able to sneak up on the Russian camp encampments and stuff like that, and uh, because they were on skis and could do it quietly and things. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of training that we were receiving at that time. Yes. Did you train with snowshoes also? Uh, yeah. Well, of course the snowshoes had to be used because we had mules. That mules were the only way of carrying small artillery and things like that, and, mm -hmm. and also equipment. And so snowshoes were used by uh, certain segments of the uh, of the division. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what kind of weapon did you uh, use? Well, they were, <coughs> excuse me, all rifles, M21s, yeah. and uh, machine guns, light machine guns, mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. That was basically all just rifles. Now, because of the weather and the altitude and so on, did you have to do anything special with them to keep them from freezing up, or do you have any problems with well, them? Well, uh, I'll tell you this, that when you camped out at night, uh, when you weren't in the barracks, uh, you took your rifle right into the sleeping bag with you because otherwise everything just froze up solid mm -hmm. or the mechanism just froze and so forth. And uh, what you did, you dug a, quite a deep trench in the snow and you laid your sleeping bag down in it and, and uh, climbed in for the night and you never took your boots off or anything else because you could never get them back on in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, now what was your winter gear like? It was good equipment. I mean, for that time, uh, mm -hmm. I think they have, you know, the different types of material right. today that are different, yes. but at that time it was good equipment. Mm -hmm. Of course, you wore longer to work continually, even to bed at night, even when you were in the barracks, because the barracks were only heated by wood stoves and, <coughs> and the uh, things of that nature, but every, all the equipment was good. All the parkas and the everything, that all the gear that you had to have, and the boots at that time were good, and uh, everything was all right. Let me ask you something. Uh, did you wear like a combat boot when you skied, or you had a separate type of boot you wore? It was a, uh, it was like a combat boot, yes. It came up over your ankles, but it was, a, uh, it was not a rounded toe. It was a square-toed mm -hmm. uh, type of boot. Uh, so that it could fit into the uh, uh, bindings on the skis and so forth. Now, did you wear that boot also when you weren't skiing? No, no, you wore okay. regular uh, combat boots. Okay. At that time. Now, did you wear white camouflage at all? Or? Well, in training, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, when we worked out up at the place where the uh, Cooper Hill, which is in uh, just outside of Leadville, Colorado, which was near the camp. Uh, the, uh, it was our basic training area for that, for skiing anyhow, and uh, the, uh, we wore that type of equipment, yes, white, uh, white uh, suits to mud into the snow and things like mm -hmm. that. Now, did you have to wax your skis? Oh yeah, yeah, skis back that time all had to be waxed. Wax, yeah. So did you have to burn the old wax off every day, or? No, no, you... You either wore it off, but when you climbed, you had what they called skins that you used for climbing if you were going to be doing a lot of uphill mm -hmm. thing that you were strapped to the bottom of the ski. That uh, actually, it's a uh, it's like a seal skin, what they call a seal skin, which is uh, the hairs on the skin, uh, so they came back stuck right. into the snow, so you wouldn't slide back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long was your training uh, in Colorado? Uh, well, when I went in, it was in, <coughs> excuse me, September of uh, 43, and we trained that winter, and in the fall of, uh, or in the spring of 44, they, uh, or late, late spring, they shipped us down to uh, uh, Texas. I, th I honestly don't think they knew what they wanted to do with the division mm -hmm. at that time. And... Uh, we were in Texas about two to three months uh, doing various training and stuff down there. And at that time, of course, the Japanese were having all over the place and taking islands and things like that. And, you know, you begin to wonder whether they're going to ship us to, uh, to one of those places for which we weren't trained for, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then all of a sudden we got the uh, orders to uh, pack up our gear and they loaded us on trains. and sent us up to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, where we uh, went overseas to Italy. And, uh, now, how did you go overseas? Did you go in a uh, convoy or a single ship? No, well, no, ship it, was a big, uh, it was a big liner. Matter of fact, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the... Uh, it was the second largest liner at the time that we were on, and, uh, but it was in a convoy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, you zigzag back and forth across the ocean and uh, things like that. And uh, we landed in uh, in Italy, and uh, 
were camped there. I say camped, uh, camped there for approximately three weeks. So we got all our gear and equipment together and things like that, and then they shipped us directly up to the front. And that's where we fought the war, of course, and, uh, mm -hmm. until it ended in the, in the spring. When was the first time that you were under fire? You recall? It was just before, uh, it was either, either late November or very early, early December. How did you feel the first time? <laughs> I'll tell you, it's no fun. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, here you've gone through a lot of training and are told to expect all of this, but you, you never really fully appreciate it till it happens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the, uh, I'll tell you, the, our training was great, and the people that were in, in our division and, and my company and our and the squad and regiment that I was in. What regiment were you assigned to? I was the 86th, Company G. Now the Germans that you fought, they were mountain troops also? Uh, yes, some of them were, yes. Mm -hmm. Because we, uh, uh, where we were, we went up through the, uh, the foothills of the, uh, of, uh, of Italy uh, to cross the Po and then up in Right on up through to the border of Switzerland on Lake de Garda. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were, we were in mountainous fighting, yes, uh, all the way through. What did you think of, uh, <clears throat> of them as uh, fighting men and also their equipment? Was their equipment good or? You mean what? The, the German Germans? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they had good equipment and the. Uh, the hard part about understanding, not understanding, but uh, trying to overcoming it is the, the two greatest fears you have. Of course, you're in the woods a lot, being in the mountains, and they'd shell, they couldn't directly shell, but they'd lob shells over you, and then mm -hmm. when they hit the trees, they burst, and when they burst, they scatter this way, the shrapnel, mm -hmm. rather than hitting the ground. And, Coming totally. this way. So if you were in the ground somewhere in the trench or a, a foxhole, uh, the shrapnel went over you. But when they burst in the trees, they came down. You could be in the in the foxholes, and uh, you still got hit. Mm -hmm. if, uh, you were unfortunate. Mm -hmm. What was daily like life like? Uh, you mean in the actual combat? Yes. Uh, we were on the move continually. Uh, I mean, they didn't let you sit around too long in any one place because the Germans were retreating at that time, and uh, the uh, so we continually had to keep right on the move to keep right up to them mm -hmm. and uh, keep uh, fighting. Yes, and crossing the Po was probably one of the you might say more dangerous uh, of the situations, uh, simply because the you're out in open water and boats and mm -hmm. any way you could get across the way they had it for us to get across and the uh, you're right out in the open to be shelled and shot at and everything else. Yeah. Now, what kind of boats did you use across? Well, they had some combat boats that they uh, they brought up to, uh, from. Down below, or when I say down below, somewhere in Italy, where they mm -hmm. had brought them in. But the uh, and they also, of course, used some of the bridges. They had to help rebuild the bridges to uh, get across. And a lot of it, you waded out into the water and uh, you get into rowboat type things and so forth. Were you ever injured or wounded or have any illnesses while you were there? No, I was extremely fortunate. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wounded and. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very thankful for that because uh, we lost roughly a thousand men killed and over four thousand uh, uh, wounded in one way or another in the division. In the division. Did you ever suffer from frostbite at all? No, no, no. We. If I did, I didn't know it. <laughs> How would you rate your officers? We had good men. 
They were all well trained and most of them were of course uh, mountain men of some type or another. Uh, many of them came from ski areas and many of them were Europeans. You pe people like Herbert Schneider and Austrian who his father Hannes was the uh, developed the Arlberg technique and uh, so forth and uh, many European uh, people that were skiers and mountain climbers and uh, rock climbers and so forth mm -hmm. and uh, they were all good. So we were trained well, we were extremely trained. Well done. Could you describe some of your your combats that were you were at, you were in? You were of the Weaver Ridge and so on. Yeah, I was at uh, I was based at uh, our company was based at uh, Weaver Ridge and uh, the Germans. This is a ridge, and uh, if you can picture a, a ridge, a mountain coming like this, and they're up in the top, and of course he who holds the high ground. Uh, controls mm -hmm. everything underneath it. And the Germans were pretty well entrenched up there. Uh, although, I won't say heavily, but they, they had quite a few good number and they had their uh, guns and so forth up there that they shot over. And advancing troops coming up the up through the Po and along mm -hmm. that way. And uh, we were stationed at the foot of uh, one side of the uh, uh, River Ridge, and uh, the Germans, of course, don't expect anybody to come up beside a, a rock wall type thing that uh, you might say, like the side of these walls here, almost. And uh, so they they had no sentries or anybody out to uh, expect any type of an uh, attack that way, and. Uh, so the at night we used to go up and uh, drive pitons into the into the rock so that we could put our ropes up through there and everything. But we had to when you drive the piton in, of course you hear a big clang. So we had mm -hmm. to put uh, we had to wrap uh, cloth or uh, padding over the heads of the mm -hmm. of the uh, ice axes and the hammers to. Uh, Drive the pitons in so they wouldn't make a big clang and mm -hmm. set off a warning that something was happening down below. Them. Obviously, that worked pretty well. Yeah, it did, and they were able to string the uh, the ropes through the uh, pitons and so forth for the uh, <coughs> excuse me climb up, and uh, it was rugged because it was done at night and mm -hmm. it was moonlight, and of course one way they created. Uh, that we were able to, I say we, the uh, divisions and the allies were able to create uh, moonlight so that you could see better was that they would shine these big, uh, uh, what do you like call them? Spotlights? Yeah, spotlights, yeah, yeah, up in the clouds mm -hmm. and, and reflect off the oh, clouds okay. and back down. So you had uh, pretty bright light, uh, or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. man made moonlight actually. Did you yourself uh, were you involved in that attack? Yeah, yes, I was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did you describe how you felt and your what you did your, during that? Well, when you say how you felt, you there's always goosebumps all over you all the time. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's one of those things that you worry about. And <coughs> Excuse me, but the. Uh, A lot of times you don't have time to think even, mm -hmm. you just have to you try to remember what you got to do and where you got to go and what you're going to do and uh, you really don't have time to think about being hit or anything else. Uh, and, I, and as I say, I was quite fortunate I never received any injuries of any type. But I was just one of the few that didn't because mm -hmm. everybody seemed to get hit and, and many of course, <coughs> excuse me, were killed and uh, it's unfortunate but unfortunately that's what war is about too. But the Germans were completely taken by surprise up there and when they were, uh, when they could no longer observe 
what was coming up uh, from the south, uh, with the Allies coming up from the south, uh, they had to retreat. They basically they were <coughs> excuse me in retreat after that point, and uh, realizing that Italy was going to be taken. And so we ended up uh, on Lake Degarda, and they, of course, had forted the, <coughs> excuse me, had fortified, <coughs> fortified the tunnels and uh, either blocked them off, uh, you know, exploded the tunnels so you couldn't mm -hmm. go through them. And uh, we, the only way we could get around that would be to get back on the road again. Uh, or to go out on these uh, ducks that uh, they brought up from Italy for, from the ocean there somewhere. And, uh, and that is a scary thing because you're out there and the Germans are shelling you and you have no way of escaping it if you got hit. Mm -hmm. And if you got hit, you went down because you had a pack on and everything else. You couldn't. You couldn't swim, and the water was, you know, freezing, and uh, things like that. And so you just prayed to God that uh, you'd survive, and I won. I was one of the fortunate ones that did. Yes, but that's how we got around to uh, to uh, keep the Germans pushed forward until we got up to Riva Ridge, which is where the war was ended, or mm -hmm. we heard the war had ended, and uh, that was right on the edge of the border that goes into Switzerland and over into Austria. How uh, was the reaction in your unit when they heard this? Oh, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, I think we all got drunk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have uh, much contact with the Italian people at all? Not really. Uh, some of the, interestingly enough, uh, some of the people, or some of the, <coughs> excuse me, some of the men did. And one interesting story is the, uh, every three years we've always gone, I say we, the division has gone back. Uh, and went back over the route that we fought on. And uh, the, uh, one of the fellows, uh, had slept in a barn, and he had hung his, uh, you, know, you have your drinking cup on your canteen, mm -hmm. and he had hung it up on the side of the wall of the barn, and he had, of course, he had scratched his initials and whatever in that, in the, uh, on the canteen, uh, you know, so nobody else could swipe it off, and uh, he had forgot it. And he went back on one of those trips. Now here you're talking 40 <clears throat> some odd years later. He went back in the barn. He went back to see where he had been. And he went in that barn and that cup was still hanging up on the wall. The farmer used it to, to feed the chickens or whatever and scoop out the meal or whatever he threw out to, the, to them. And then he hung the thing back up with that cup. He found that cup and as a matter of fact he made dripplings, believe it or not. <clears throat> when he came back, he was so proud of that. <laughs> uh, and they uh, wrote to Ripley, I guess, and he put it in the paper. So, how many times have you gone back? I've been back three times mm -hmm. and uh, enjoyed every minute of it, and uh, it brings back a lot of memories mm -hmm. and things like that. But it's, did you scale uh, the ridge? What's that? Did you scale oh, the ridge this no. time? <laughs> no, I'm getting a little too old for that business. <laughs> Now, do you still ski at all? Yes, I do, except for the last year I've developed arthritis, so to speak, and uh, that sort of held me back and I have held off. I'm going to try it again this year, although I think I'll get into cross country maybe. And if we have some snow. If we get some <laughs> snow, you're right. <laughs> so, um, now, after the war ended, did your unit go home right away or were you assigned to occupation? Yeah, no, they. Uh, uh, we thought we were going to be there, we were, but they no, we went back, and at that time, and I think, although we've never heard, uh, I think the reason for that was that they were getting ready to send us down to still fight the Japanese. Mm -hmm. 
and we were just about two days out of uh, Norfolk uh, uh, before we landed in Norfolk and uh, the war was declared over. Uh, the Japanese had uh, threw up their hands and quit. And the, uh, so, in a way, <clears throat> while we weren't the uh, oldest troops in Europe, uh, we were the, basically the first back home. Uh, simply because I guess the, uh, my thinking is that they wanted to, they were going to ship us to fight the Japanese on the islands or wherever they were. And uh, so we were fortunate to be home earlier than many of the troops that were still in Europe. One thing I want to go back, um, when the, the troops are in, in <clears throat> Germany, um, they had wholesale surrenders of units. Did you have a lot of Germans surrendering to you? And oh, in Italy, yes. In Italy, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was quite a few. They weren't. I mean, they weren't large. Yeah, that's right. You didn't large have large numbers. A lot of more individuals and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, but they, uh, they, uh, they were surrendering and they retreated. Uh, they were able, actually able to retreat back up into into Germany mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth because uh, we were pushing it pretty hard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, when did you arrive back in the States? Well, let's see, the war, we went, uh, what, the war ended in what, 45 was it? Yes. We got back here and I think it was August. The war ended in the spring, yeah, it was in mm -hmm. May. Or, and uh, we got back here in around August. Uh, mm -hmm. so when were you discharged? Well, I got shipped out to uh, Colorado. I'm not trying to think of the name of the camp now. Uh, for discharge, and I was discharged. Uh, we got back in the spring. I guess it was in the fall. So it would be the fall of about 40, 45. 45. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, have any remembrances that stick out more than others? <clears throat> Not really. Uh, I can't say that. I'll tell you, I was the one remembrance I was up on Lake Degarda when we were out in those ducks. I was. You're scared as hell mm -hmm. because you're out there and you can't do a damn thing. And uh, you're being shot at and all you can do is hope you're not hit. Mm -hmm. Because you're you're crammed into there and you're standing side by side they have them just as full as they possibly could. And if the and if the the duck itself got hit uh, and sank, there was nothing you could do mm -hmm. except go right to the bottom. And I think that was probably the I guess the worst fear of any that I can think of or experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always afraid of getting hit and so forth, but, uh, but when you're in a situation like that, knowing that you don't stand a damn chance, that, mm -hmm. uh, one of those things. Did you make use of the GI Bill after, at the end of the war? At the end of the, uh, after the war, did you use the GI Bill at all? The J bill. G I bill. Oh, G I bill. Yeah, I went to uh, I went to uh, over to Wesleyan in Connecticut for a year, and then uh, when I came back from there, uh, I went right to work. My my dad's uh, laundry. We had a laundry mm -hmm. that my grandfather actually had started, and we had trucks out that went to your house and mm -hmm. picked up your laundry and so forth and delivered it and. Then <clears throat> the, the, uh, that became when longer mats and things came into being, that sort of drove our business out of business. And uh, that's when I went to work for the state with the uh, conservation department, which and, uh, we own, you know, White Face Corps in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had uh, I was in charge of the uh, ski schools of those three areas and, uh, you know, hiring the mm -hmm. The uh, get the ski school operational and so forth, and 
things like that. Do you ever use a 5220 club? I can't even tell you what that is. That was uh, like an unemployment of $20 a week for 52 weeks? No, no. You weren't ready to back to work? No. Okay. Um, did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Uh, well, I belong to uh, we the, or the uh, the tent has their own association. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, I belong to that. Okay. Yes. You don't belong to American Legion or any. Uh, I belong to the Legion. Okay. Yeah. I don't attend their meetings, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, are you are active with the Tenth Mountain? Uh, yes. Position. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the uh, the there's about five. Well, there's an upstate chapter, there's a New England chapter, there's a uh, lower chapter, there's chapters all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've gone to, of course, the upstate chapter, and I've been to all of their meetings, uh, or most of them anyhow, and I've gone over to uh, North Conway in New Hampshire and gone to some of theirs because I, I go and visit with some friends to ski with. and. Uh, uh, I go usually at the time because he, Herbert Snyder, is a member of the tent. And we go to the meetings together and drink a little bit, you know, and tell mm -hmm. eyes and, you know. <laughs> so you stay in contact, you've, have you always stayed in contact with men that you served with? Yeah, there's, uh, uh, as well as basically three of them that uh, uh, we drop notes back and forth together each time and or each year. and. Uh, Christmas cards, and we call on the phone occasionally and see how things are going. But uh, unfortunately, uh, that list is getting lower and lower. It's, uh, we're at an age now where it's, uh, you know, you mm -hmm. not much longer left life left, unfortunately. And, uh, but we do keep in touch, yes. Mm -hmm. and the Did division. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. The division has uh, been active, and as a matter of fact, they have a, uh, uh, I call it a junior division. It's the uh, children of the Tenth Mountain guys that uh, form their own basic group and uh, to keep track of things and so forth. And they're apparently doing quite well. Do you ever see any USO shows? Uh, very few. Mm -hmm. Very few. Uh, other than the skiing and the friends that I have that were in the tent and things like that and then the association at the meetings that uh, mm -hmm. uh, they have because I belong to the upstate chapter and I belong, actually I belong to the uh, upstate or the New England chapter also mm -hmm. I belong to two chapters and go to their, they go to their meetings mm -hmm. uh, and things like that that's about it how did your time in the service, or, and especially your time in the Tenth Mountain, how did you think that changed or had an effect on your life? I think it had a good one. Uh, it, it taught you, number one, to obey uh, orders and all of that. If you were directors from, hey, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is where you found out uh, whether you had it or not. Darn good training, and uh, when you came out of it, you came out of it. Uh, if you came through it, you came out a man. I'll tell you. And, uh, I think it was. Uh, I think the training, as hard as you may think it was at the time, had to be that way for you to survive. And, uh, hey, here I am. Do you think, in retrospect? Uh, the training you received was adequate? I think so, yes. Uh, I am disappointed in a way. Uh, all the Alpine countries in Europe all have specific mountain troops. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we have one up in uh, upstate New York, the, uh, here, the uh, what they call a light tent. Uh, they are trained. Of course, warfare is different today than mm -hmm. it was back then, too. But they have sort of disbanded. I'm sorry to see that they disbanded having a complete regiment of uh, mountain troops mm -hmm. trained specifically for mountain warfare. Uh, some of the light tent is, of course, there's units in it that are trained that way, but they're also trained for 
sea duty landing, mm -hmm. uh, boat landing on the shores and things like that. But I think uh, I think that was a, a good move that they made in World War II to uh, to have a mountain division. And, uh, as it turned out, uh, I think they felt that they did the right thing, or the government did the right thing. That they did. And I'd like to see that, see us or the country have a, a complete division of training like we had, mm -hmm. and specifically for that type of warfare. Well, the warfare is entirely different mm -hmm. today, fought entirely different. There's been uh, quite a bit written on the Tenth Mountain lately. Have you read any of the books on the Tenth Mountain? Yeah, I've got some. Uh, I can't even tell you their names mm -hmm. now, but uh, I do have a pretty good library of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think most of the books are ac accurate? Accurate? Yeah, because they're uh, they're done by written by the people that mm -hmm. were in it, of course, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, they may have been in a different unit, a different company or division or battalion, or whatever, uh, or regiment. But the uh, we were all together in it, and uh, they're good. No question about it. And I think that's a great thing that our grandchildren have these uh, these uh, articles and these books and mm -hmm. so forth mm -hmm. to be able to uh, read about in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you very much for your Hey, time. you're very welcome. I thank you for having us up here. I hope you understood what I've told you. Yes. Whatever.